Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. In today's installment of the Evidence for Evolution series, we are looking at the fossil record. We've been leading up to this for two weeks, but now it is finally time to dig in. Ah? Uh, ah? Uh? <laughs> So let's go! First, I would like to start by explaining how we determine the age of a fossil. I laid the groundwork for this over the last two videos, the ones on geology and dating methods, so if you haven't seen those two yet, I'd recommend giving them a look before continuing on with this one. So from those two videos, we learned how scientists determine the ages of certain types of rocks, but the rocks that can be directly radiometrically dated do not usually contain fossils, and just a minor correction here, I said metamorphic and igneous rock would never contain fossils in the last video, but you can find fossils occasionally in metamorphic rocks such as marble. But the process of metamorphism is not very kind to the fossils, so they are exceedingly rare. As for igneous, again, it is possible, but it's incredibly rare. And this is counting volcanic ash as sedimentary rock. It is technically igneous. Uh, one of the common phrases I heard was that it's igneous when it goes up and it's sediment when it comes down, because it behaves as a sediment when it comes down. Though, unlike other sedimentary rock, it can be directly dated. And on top of that, I completely missed pointing out in my last couple videos that volcanic ash makes really good stratigraphic markers. That is, they can often be fairly widespread because of how far the ash can travel from the source of the eruption, and because each eruption has its own unique chemical signature. So let's start here. If you find a fossil in a rock that was formed from volcanic ash, finding the date of the ash layer will give you the date of the fossil. Those are the easy ones. But what about fossils buried in, say, sandstone? Well, using radiometric dating techniques on sandstone will give you the ages of the grains that make up the sandstone rather than of the sandstone itself. But a sandstone cannot be older than its youngest zircon, zircons being crystals that are common throughout most types of rock. So that can give you a rough idea of how old the sandstone is, but it won't be exact. This is where we combine the principles of stratigraphy with different absolute dating methods to determine age ranges for each layer of rock, and the fossils that are found in the rocks were most likely buried by whatever depositional event ended up forming the rocks, so they will be the same age as the rocks in which they are found. That's all well and good, so now we have ways of figuring out when the different organisms lived and what environments they might have lived in, and even in some cases how they probably died, but what has that got to do with evolution? Well, the fossil record goes back billions of years into the past, and it gives us momentary glimpses into what life existed in the past, so if evolution is true, we would expect the fossil record to show us the actual evolutionary history of different organisms, and we would expect to see a trend of less diversity the further back in time you go. So let's just start by going as far back in time as we can and see what we find there. Hunting for old zircons can get us back to about 4.4 billion years, but there's no sign of any life that far back. The first signs of life showed up about 3.5 billion years ago in the early Archean, but fossil evidence of this life is quite rare until the late Archean with the appearance of stromatolites, which are rocks that are formed by the growth of several layers of cyanobacterial mats. The diversity of these organisms gradually increased throughout the Archean, peaking at about a billion years ago, and then starting to fade in both abundance and diversity some 700 million years ago, possibly due to the rise in herbivorous eukaryotes that would feed on them. This represents the majority of the fossil record of the Precambrian. It's almost exclusively single-celled organisms, with the first evidence of multicellular organisms appearing 2.1 billion years ago. So that's 1.4 billion years after single-celled life emerged. For comparison, animals only emerged from the sea about 530 million years ago, so for the vast majority of the history of the Earth, there was nothing but single-celled organisms. And then for a good chunk of the rest of the history of the Earth, the most complex organisms were multicellular algae. And this brings us to the Cambrian period. The beginning of the Cambrian shows a massive diversification of life. This is when we see the appearance of almost every major animal phyla. That is, if we look at Linnaean taxonomy, it's the highest level before you get to the kingdom level, with kingdom being the division between animals, plants, fungi, protists, and monera. So most major animal phyla make their first appearance here, 
but they would have looked very different from the members of those phyla that we see today. So for instance, this weird fishy eel looking thing is known as Pacaya and was one of the earliest known chordates. So this guy represents you in that portion of the fossil record, and everything else with the spinal cord for that matter. And as a side note, this dude has only ever been found in Canada, so as it turns out, all chordates are Canadians. Yes, I know the landmass that we call Canada today didn't even exist back then, just let me have this. Back on topic, the Cambrian is when we see the first appearance of animals with mineralized skeletons and shells, though these still represent a minority of the fossils that we have from this time period. This is when we start to see the rise of different ecosystems, as these organisms' interactions were becoming more complicated. Predation caused the cyanobacterial mats that had been fairly ubiquitous up to this point to only survive in environments that their predators had not yet moved into. Tube-dwelling organisms evolved, which started to mix up the sediment at the bottom of the seafloor, causing what is known as the Cambrian Substrate Revolution, and essentially creating new ecological niches to be filled. Before the Cambrian, trace fossils left behind by early multicellular animals were very simple, just being horizontal lines along the surface. In the Cambrian, they started showing signs of more complicated movement, such as burrowing vertically through the sediment and just generally showing more variability in their behavior. So throughout the Cambrian, we see a relatively sudden increase in the diversity of life, and sudden here is a period of about 25 million years, so that's still an unimaginably vast amount of time, but it represents a measly 0.6% of the time that the Earth had existed up until this point. So geologically speaking, that is incredibly quickly. Now why it happened so fast is a matter of some debate, but it is likely due to a combination of factors ranging from the increase in selection pressures caused by the development of predation, to the availability of oxygen for metabolic processes, to the first appearance of some of the important body plan related developmental genes, to environmental factors. But while the Cambrian explosion gets all the attention for being the first rapid biodiversification event, it was tiny in comparison to the Great Ordovician Biodiversification Event. This happened after the Cambrian, and is when we first see the appearance of coral reefs and their accompanying ecosystems, though coral ecosystems would continue to be dominated by sponges and algae for quite some time after this. There was an approximately 300% increase in biodiversity during this time period. The Cambrian was amazing because it saw the emergence and experimentation with the various body plans. The Ordovician is where those body plans started to specialize. Trilobites, which first appeared in the Cambrian, continued to diverge in the Ordovician and increase in size. The largest trilobite found to date was 72 centimeters long. An increase in the diversity and types of plankton triggered a corresponding rise in diversity among suspension feeders. Both plankton and suspension feeders are important parts of the food web, so their diversification triggered still more diversification of the other organisms that were part of the same food web. Essentially, the diversification of the plankton and suspension feeders made nutrients more readily available for organisms that use them as food sources. The Ordovician was marked by shallow seas covering much of the continent of Gondwana, which served as fertile breeding grounds for species like the trilobites. It's also where we find the first signs of life making its way out of the sea and onto land, with the appearance of terrestrial arthropods and plant microfossils. And while this biodiversification was happening, the planet was very volcanically active, which provides geologists and paleontologists with several layers of volcanic ash that allow for easy and extensive calibration of the fossil record from this time period. The end of the Ordovician period is marked by an extinction event that was probably caused by the beginning of an ice age. Ice ages tend to lower sea levels, and as quite a bit of the life that developed in the Ordovician were living in shallow seas around Gondwana, that was bad news for them. This marked the beginning of the Silurian period, which saw the development of the first intelligent life, bipedal reptiles that hid deep underground to avoid what they saw as a coming extinction event. Doctor Who's a documentary, right? Now, I could keep going like this through all the time periods in Earth's history, but I'll just show this graph, which demonstrates the point that I'm getting at. As evolution progresses, the amount of diversity of the organisms living on the Earth increases. There are occasional extinction events that can remove quite a bit of the diversity, but aside from those events, the trend is clear and exactly what we would expect in light of the theory of evolution. But it's not just the fact that we see an increase in biodiversity, it's also the way the biodiversity increases. Once a body plan shows up in the Cambrian, we don't see new body plans developed to fill the same niches, we see modifications of that original body plan. Because the way evolution works, if something, like a body plan, can do the job well enough to allow the organism to survive, then that body plan will survive. 
if a slight modification to that body plan works just a little bit better, then that modification will gradually permeate the population. This is because a mutation that makes a small change to an existing structure is much less likely to be detrimental than one that makes a large sudden change. So once a structure develops to begin with, it is much easier for evolution to work on this existing structure than to eliminate it and make a new one from scratch. And this is how we end up with vestigial features. So if all this is the case, then we would expect to see evidence in the fossil record of organisms that are partway in between two stages. The two stages we are examining don't really matter. Evolution has no goals after all, so really any organism can be considered to be partway between stages. But there are certain transitions that appeal to us and are easier to pick out, such as the transition from sea to land. Tiktaalik is an excellent example of this transition. It has scales and gills like a fish, and its fins have the same ray bones for paddling as most other fish do, but there are also other bones in the fins that are more sturdy, suggesting that Tiktaalik was able to prop itself up in shallow water with them. It also has a rib cage that is a lot more sturdy than most fish, it has shoulders, and it has a neck. Jawed fish have a bone in their jaws called the hyomandibula. This bone eventually shrank and developed into the middle ear bone called the stapes. Tiktaalik's hyomandibula is smaller than its ancestors, but not nearly as small as the stapes bones are today. Ancient fish skulls are also jointed, which helps the fish with feeding and breathing underwater. Tiktaalik's skull is not quite as fused as a tetrapod skull, but it is more rigid and stiff than its fish ancestors. And while Tiktaalik probably was not the first vertebrate to venture onto land, it is from 375 million years ago and we have found probable vertebrate footprints on what would have been land in 400 million year old rock, it is still an excellent example of the transition from sea to land. But how do we know that Tiktaalik actually is the ancestor of all land vertebrates? Well, we don't. In fact, it is quite likely that it was not the ancestor of the vertebrates, but that it was closely related to an unknown species that was the actual ancestor. It is estimated that only one-tenth of one percent of all the species to ever have lived are actually represented in the fossil record, and then the chances of a human finding those fossils are smaller still. So keeping these two facts in mind, it is highly unlikely that any given fossil that we find is an actual representative of a lineage that survived all the way to today. This is why, when you look at representations of the Tree of Life, or phylogenies, they usually don't show direct descent, but descent from an unknown common ancestor. So Tiktaalik is probably not our ancestor, but it is representative of a group of similar organisms that would have existed around the same time, one of which would be our actual ancestor, and Tiktaalik would have had a common ancestor with that unknown organism. It is possible that Tiktaalik is our direct ancestor, but the odds are heavily stacked against it. And this is the case for all of the fossil series that we see. The Pachycetus was probably not the ancestor of modern whales, but would have had a close evolutionary relationship to the organism that whales actually did descend from. Now with that in mind, let's take a look at Pachycetus and the evolution of cetaceans, with cetaceans being the order of aquatic mammals including whales, dolphins, and porpoises. Pachycetus was a mammal that looked almost nothing like a whale. Its ankle bones contained a pulley structure that is only found in even-toed ungulates, like giraffes, so this placed it clearly within the lineage of the even-toed ungulates. Except it also had an ear bone that contained two features that are entirely unique to cetaceans. The involucrum, essentially a thick wall of bone covering the ear, and the sigmoid process, which is a bone that encloses part of the middle ear. Cetaceans are the only animals known to have structures like this, so it made sense to consider Pachycetus to be part of the evolutionary history of modern cetaceans. And as we discovered new, more recent fossils, this positioning made even more sense. Ambulocetus was obviously closely related to Pachycetus, including the cetacean ear bones and the ungulate ankle bones, but it was more specialized to an aquatic lifestyle with a stronger tail and paddle-like feet. Using stable oxygen isotope analysis, scientists are able to determine whether an animal drank freshwater or saltwater during its lifetime. Pachycetus drank freshwater. Ambulocetus drank a mixture of both, and when we come just a little bit closer to modern times, we find other proto-whales like Prozuglodon or Cuchycetus, whose name I'm probably mispronouncing, but I like to think that it got that name from being ticklish. Coochie coochie coo? It's Cuchycetus, the ticklish whale! 
Not only do we find even higher levels of the oxygen isotopes that indicate they drank mostly, if not exclusively, salt water, but we find that the nostrils are starting to move back toward the middle of the snout instead of being at the tip of the nose, all while the hind legs are becoming smaller and less useful for walking on land. And as you get closer to modern-day cetaceans, they look more and more like modern-day cetaceans, which still have the remnants of pelvises hovering about where they should be if a whale were to grow hind legs. So, to recap, we learned over the last two episodes how exactly scientists are able to put together pictures of ancient ecosystems through geology and figure out exactly how old these ecosystems are. And the fossil record shows that the farther back in time you go, the less diverse the ecosystems become. And remarkably, we even have several fossil series that are good representatives of certain types of transitions. I only touched on tiktalic and cetaceans here, but we also have excellent fossil series showing the development of flight, the evolution of modern horses, and even modern humans. If you're interested in seeing human development, I highly recommend the series Systematic Classification of Life by Aaron Ra. He goes through the fossil record and finds the different representatives of our ancestry all the way back to the first single-celled organisms that appeared three and a half billion years ago. If you're mostly just interested in the human part of the series, start on episode 37, which covers the extinction event that killed the dinosaurs and led to the rise of the primates. That's it for today. Thanks for watching. Special thanks, as always, to my patrons, without whom this series would not be possible. If you'd like to support the series, head over to patreon.com slash vicerhino to pledge as little as $1 a week, which will give you some nice perks like early access to my Friday videos, discounts at my merch store, and 3D printed goodies. You can also follow me on Twitter at vicerhino, or find the link to my Facebook page in the description. And I also have a P.O. box if, for whatever reason, you want to send me stuff. See you next time! 